Well, hiya, BookTube. Bill Rutenberg here with the Rutenberg Library. I uh, wanted to come to you today with a book haul. Um, over the last week, I have been um, able to collect uh, several books. Uh, some of them I paid for, and a whole bunch of them I got for free. And so, uh, you know, you can never go wrong with free books. And I wanted to showcase those to you, show those to you. Um, Several of them I'm going to do, I think probably two more book hauls because I got quite a few. But uh, I wanted to share the ones from last weekend and then pretty early in the week. And um, yeah, so let's just go ahead and get started. So like I said, last weekend we went, my wife and I went down to Kansas City to Ikea. Um, she was needing to pick up a uh, TV stand. We Our old TV stand uh, was a little bit beat up. We've had it since we first got married and um, she just thought it was time to get something that was you know clean and sleek and matched everything. Who'd know? You know who would know that uh, my wife would want everything to match? I, I don't know. But anyway um, while we were down there uh, I was able to pick up uh, you know some magazine holders they're they're you know it's a hard plastic it's uh, pretty affordable you get two per pack and I actually picked up a couple of these so that I could put my new magazines in them and try to keep everything nice and neat in the upstairs library and so that was the first thing we picked up and then let me show you what we got in the mail um, I've got a couple of different magazine subscriptions that I have and the very first one because I got this uh, what was it it was like seven or eight bucks for a whole year subscription I think it was dirt cheap but it was a uh, bibli biblical archaeological review and this is the spring of 2021 and uh, I got that new magazine in so I'm I'm pleased to have that I haven't had a chance to go through it yet but I got that in this week it looked like there was some neat stuff in there that they were um, you know going through and digging up and just looks like it's going to be a pretty neat pretty neat uh, read I haven't had a subscription to this one for in, it, it's been a while um, another one that I had just subscribed to because it was really cheap and uh, this is Smithsonian Magazine, and we've got some polar bears on the cover there. And I always like these. They, got, they always have really good articles in them, and they can range from anywhere from American history to you know world history to geography. It's got all kinds of stuff in there, and it looked like this one had some good stuff in it, some good articles. And so um, very happy to have that. And so let me show you what I got while we were going down to Ikea. So we stopped in St. Joe at the uh, Books Revisited used bookstore there in St. Joe. They sell hardback books for $2, paperbacks for $1, and um, some of them have come out of... Um, circulation out of the library but they're all in really good shape and some of them are just donations to books revisited and then they just resell them um really good stuff i was very pleased the first one that i picked up and i wasn't familiar with it or anything uh the picture on the cover is really what got me i thought that was really cool i love paintings of uh, ships and stuff and so this is the rising sun by douglas galbraith galbraith and so um, pick that up, like I said, for two bucks. I figured you can't go wrong. It's a historical fiction. It is from Atlantic Monthly Press out of New York. And it's a 2001 novel, but, you know, it's in brand new condition. So I'm real excited to, you know, dig into that sometime. Um, found The Arrogance of Power, The Secret World of Richard Nixon by Anthony Summers. And so, again, really uh, a book that's in excellent condition, new condition. And um, it is a Viking from the year 2000. And I'll share the front cover with you. It says, um, more than two decades after he resigned from the presidency, Richard Nixon has lost none of his fascination. From the ongoing debates about his record, in office to the uh, contentious struggles over the White House tapes. We as a nation seem obsessed 
with the need to understand our most infamous political figure. In The Arrogance of Power, award-winning investigative journalist Anthony Summers offers an unprecedented examination of a president whose personality embraced both political brilliance and criminal vind vindictiveness. Drawing on more than a thousand interviews and five years of research, Summers traces Nixon's career from his youth in California through his controversial terms in Congress and the vice presidency to his turbulent days in the Oval Office. The pattern that emerges is of a man driven by a lifelong addiction to intrigue and power. A man whose subversion of democracy during the Watergate was, in fact, merely the culmination of years of cynical manipulation of the political system. Summers documents, pre documents previously undisclosed facts about Nixon's role in plotting to topple Fidel Castro and in the attempted sabotage of the Vietnam peace talks his unscrupulous acceptance of funds from dubious sources, his difficulties with alcohol, and his use of unprescribed medication, his mental and emotional instability, with exclusive access to the doctor, doctor who sought to help him, the truth about his best friend, uh, Baby Rebozo, and his troubled marriage to his wife, Pat. The arrogance of power will destroy forever the image Nixon sought to make his legacy, presenting in its place a stark portrait of a man whose personal torments came to have such a damaging impact on 50 years of American history. And so, um, you know, I just recently last year finished the third volume of Stephen Ambrose's trilogy on uh, Nixon, and it was pretty fascinating reading. And I think this will be, uh, this volume will go right with that. It'll, it'll be a good read. Um, such a controversial political figure. And, uh, you know, always interesting to read about. Uh, the next book that I picked up was The U-Boat War, 1914 to 1918 by Edwin A. Gray. And um, I really enjoy reading about World War I. So this will be, uh, I think, something that'll just, that'll go right, it's, it's right up my alley. And so I'm excited to have this. This is from Leo Cooper out of London. And it is a 1994 book. Originally, it looks like originally copyrighted in 1972, but this edition is 1994. And this says, um, the explosion which followed changed history as the date of the ship's log was May 7th, 1915. The steamer was the Lusitania and the torpedo sent 1,195 innocent men, women, and children to a watery grave. In 1914, U-boats were a new untried weapon, and when such a weapon can bring a mighty empire to the brink of defeat, there is a story worth telling. Edwin Gray's The U-Boat War is the history of the Kaiser's attempt to destroy the British Empire by a ruthless campaign of unrestricted submarine warfare. It opens with Germany's first tentative experiments with submarines and climaxes with the naval mutiny that helped bring down the Kaiser. In between is a de detailed account of a campaign of terror which by April of 1917 had the British Empire on the verge of surrender. The cost in lives and equipment was staggering. On the German side, 4,894 sailors and 515 officers lost their lives in action. 178 German submarines were destroyed by the Allies, 14 were scuttled, and 122 surrendered. According to the most reliable sources, 5,708 ships were destroyed by the U-boats and 13,333 non-combatants perished in British ships. World figures for civilian casualties were never released. The U-boat war is a savage but thrilling account of men fighting for their lives beneath the sea and of the boats that changed the face of naval warfare. And so, uh, you know, that sounds really interesting. Like I said, I teach a... Uh, a, a pretty good sized World War One unit with my seventh grade. They always enjoy that. So that'll be good to have that, you know, just for my knowledge to help in, uh, you know, just telling the story of the U-boat. The kids are always kind of fascinated by it with it, uh, you know, being the first, the first successful, continuously successful underwater um, naval ship, 
You know, we'd had a couple before in history, but they, they weren't continuously successful. This, this would be the, the start of under, underwater warfare, and uh, the kids are always fascinated by it. So I'm, I'm excited to read that. Uh, here's, a, here's another one. This is uh, four generations of John, a John Adams' family, Descent from Glory. Paul, by Paul C. Nagel. So, uh, and I think I said that backwards, actually. Let me try that again. Descent from Glory, Four Generations of John Adams' Family by Paul C. Nagel. So, got that. Um, I got some other books on the, on, uh, the Adams Family, and I've read a couple, but I have not read all of them, and I'd like to read a couple of these that, that cover the entire family. So, um... Anyway, let me read the inside cover to you here. The public lives of John Adams and his descendants made them America's most distinguished family. But what of their private world? What was it like to be a part of such an eminent lineage, which included presidents, diplomats, and renowned historians? Descent from Glory answers these questions in rich perspective detail, unfolding the Adams saga from 1735 to 1927. Charles Francis Adams, John's grandson, revealed as much as he dared when he observed that his family's history was one of the great triumphs in the world, but of deep groans within, one of extraordinary brilliancy and deep corroding mortification. His sons then sealed the family's enormous collection of letters and diaries for 50 years. These papers remain unopened until our era. Mining this rich trove, Paul C. Nagel, presents a new and thoroughly absorbing view of the Adamses as husbands and wives, parents and children. Here are all of the Adamses through four generations, the great and near great, along uh, with the spendthrifts, misfits, alcoholics, and neurotics. Nagel shows us their loves and quarrels, their hopes and disappointments. As he points out, the Adams family heritage, the need to excel, destroyed many family members and handicapped even those who did su did succeed. John and Abigail Adams believed that the world was full of sin and folly and that these temptations must be resisted at all costs. Few Adams family members could live up to their challenge of excelling in the world while behaving morally in it. The history of those who failed and the anguish they uh, brought to their parents makes a moving story un an unlikely heroine emerges, Louisa Catherine Adams, John Quincy Adams' wife. Be, uh, she becomes the most appealing Adams and the one who understood the family best. And so I look forward to that. That is a um, 1983 book from Oxford University Press. And so I think that's going to be a real good read. Uh, I was very glad to find that. That'll go well with my... Um, you know, just with my American Revolution uh, collection with the Founding Fathers, and then obviously it brings it all the way into the present. So anyway, I got a whole stack of books here that over the last week I have found at our local buy one, get one, or it's not even a buy one, give one, take one library that's downtown. So I'm going to kind of go through these quick, but um, the first one that I'm actually going to add to, or possibly if I can get to it, I'm going to add to Middle Grade March list is Stolen into Slavery, The True Story of Solomon Northrop, Free Black Man by Judith and Dennis uh, Fraden. And of course, I've read 12 Years a Slave, so this, uh, you know, obviously that's the, that's the um, autobiography of Solomon Northrop. And that was a fascinating read, a uh, very sad story. But this goes right with that. Um, it says, in 1841, there were 400,000 free blacks like him living in the United States and more than five times as many enslaved. But slavery had been abolished in the northern states many years earlier and upstate New York seemed like a safe place to live, work, play his violin, and raise his family, or so he thought. In this mo moving and inspiring book, award-winning authors Judith and Dennis Fraden bring to life the incredible true story of free, educated Solomon Northrop and his 12-year odyssey as a slave. And so uh, I look forward to reading this. It's, a, like I said, a fascinating story. And how he did not lose hope when he got put back into slavery, I will never know because that would be depressing. But it's from Scholastic out of New York, and it is a 2012 
book. And so putting that in the stack for middle grade March. Now, like I said, I'm not gonna read the backs of all of these, but I'm just gonna kinda go through them quickly. But this is The Battle of Layette Golf by Edwin Hoyt, uh, Disaster and Triumph in the Bloodiest Sea Battle of World War II. So I got that in a nice little uh, paperback. And it is a Jove book and 19... 83, 1983 is this printing. And then I got A Torch to the Enemy by Martin Caden. And it is a 1960 book from Ballantine Books out of New York. And it's just a slim little volume. Most of these are fairly small. Um, this is a, a, The Battle Off Mid, Midway Island by Theodore Taylor. Um, it's from the series The Great Sea Battles of World War II, and I love these, these paintings that are on the front of several of these I'm going to show you here. That's pretty cool. Um, it is an Avon Flare book, and it is from 1981. And then the next one here, the next three are from uh, Zebra Books, the Kensington Publishing Corporation. Um, apparently they'd made a whole bunch of these World at War books and I got three of them here. So this is Valor at Okinawa, uh, Lawrence Cortesi, Cortesi, however you say that. Sorry if I butchered it. And this, this one is 1981. And then the next one that I found was Victory at Guadalcanal by Robert Edward Lee. And it is 1981. And then the last one in this stack is Bloody Friday off Guadalcanal. The gripping, searing account of the battle that heralded U.S. victory in the Pacific by Lawrence Cortesy. So, same author as Valor at Okinawa. Um, again, love the artwork on the cover there. And this is 1981. So, um, anyway, that was, you know, the collection of paperbacks there are from the, like I said, the buy, uh, I keep wanting to say buy one, get one, the, the give one, take one library. So, let me do a little pyramid here. I won't put the magazines in it, but I'll give you the little pyramid. So these are the new books in uh, this book haul. Uh, like I said, I'll have a couple more book hauls, but i uh, got quite a few here, and I'm pretty proud of what I've been able to add into the collection. I hope you guys have enjoyed this. Um, tell me what you think of the books, if you've read them. Um, thank you for watching, and uh, appreciate your time, and as always, happy reading.